Good morning and welcome to the discussion for the final countdown, what ACC network schools learned in their facility build outs. The countdown to the launch of the ACC network is rapidly nearing and in this discussion we'll question our panel about their preparation to ready for what should be another successful college sports network. Every school in division one, two, or three, regardless of their size and budget allowances, who is producing content for themselves or a network have success or horror stories that dealt with cooperation from their athletic departments, equipment purchases, training of crew, or a shopping list of other issues. We'll take a deep, well, take a deep breath, everybody. Everybody experiences these things, and we're gonna let everybody up here tell you what they've gone through so far. So joining me today to discuss how their schools are readying for the network, uh, from uh, over here on my left, or on my right, excuse me, is uh, Kelly Hammonds, Assistant AD of Broadcast and Video Productions for the University of Pittsburgh, Eric Fry, Senior Director, ACC Network Operations, Virginia Tech, Jeremy No, Executive Director, TV Productions at the University of Louisville, and Mike Slamowitz, everybody knows him as Slammer, uh, is the Director of Video Services and Live Events and ACC Network at the University of Virginia. So we're gonna go ahead and we're gonna start off and I'm gonna ask uh, Eric, Kelly, Jeremy, and Mike, can you please take a moment and tell us uh, about your new facilities? And we'll start with you, Eric. Sure, so um, our space, uh, we had a challenge of finding an existing or uh, a spot that was not gonna displace anybody else in our department. And so we took over an existing space in our football stadium uh, that was how it was used for football post-game press conferences. It's about 6,000 square feet and we built uh, two uh, mirrored uh, linear ready control rooms um, through the help of AJP and CTG, um, put Ross acuities in each room, network dream catchers in each room, uh, two expression boxes, three channels each in each room. We also have the Chiron uh, sports effects engine uh, to utilize as well. Um, all of our TOC and engineering uh, things live in that space as well, as well as office space. Uh, and so those two rooms are, were done about a month and a half ago. Uh, we did about 10 broadcasts out of those rooms uh, this spring, uh, and we'll be uh, at full go uh, by the time fall comes when the launch happens. At Pitt, we uh, had one control room available to us for ESPN3 and ACC Network, and we've used it about six years. And when we heard this project was coming, we had to find space as well. Uh, we at Pitt were lucky to find a multi-purpose room uh, that was being used for band practice before basketball games and uh, pre-game dinners and things like that. So we actually took that multi-purpose room, <coughs> split it into three control rooms, and then built out around it with broadcast offices, uh, post-production suites, TOC, and shading. And in the lobby of the Peterson Event Center, we built a studio uh, with three different what we call sets. Uh, one that's an anchor set and is very like newsy and has a desk. One that's a stand-up space uh, with a green screen and white and gray backdrops that you can roll down behind it. And then also a living room set that's a more casual, casual interview space. And so then in the back of house, uh, in those three control rooms, we have dream catchers. We're using Ross Expression, um, two channel, two box, two channels per room. And um, we have Grass Valley switchers, Grass Valley cameras and CalREC audio uh, mixers in our space. Tom, um, roll the video. So, <laughs> <laughs> so our video basically explains what we have. Uh, it's 8,000 square foot of uh, uh, square footage of space. It has a, uh, two linear control rooms with two digital control rooms. Uh, we have all the Ross equipment, Everts Dreamcatchers is our replay, along with the Everts routing system. Uh, Yamaha CL5 is our audio console, and um, uh, we're rocking and rolling. I mean, uh, we we thought we were going to be doing around 200 events out of this room this year. We're, we're, we, after this weekend, we'll be doing over 413 uh, shows. So we have already doubled what we thought we were going to do out of year one. So we're ready. Yeah, and at UVA, we were, uh, I think, one of the last, if not the last schools to get involved with doing ESPN3. Kind of got dragged kicking and screaming into it once the network was launched. But uh, so the majority of our project occurred in Fall of 2016, we used uh, AJP as our consultant and CTG here in Atlanta as our integrator. Uh, basically set up three control rooms in John Paul Jones Arena, uh, as well as a um, studio area up in the lobby where the team store used to be that has a large green screen psych wall and a physical set, as well as some storage areas for all our equipment. Uh, we've got the same kind of basic infrastructure that, that 
all the ACC schools have with Ross Expression, Ross Switchers, uh, Dreamcatcher. Um, we went Digico for our audio, uh, Eberts for the uh, routing infrastructure and the monitoring. So yeah, we've uh, we did some incremental upgrades this past year to get us uh, a little closer to where we wanted to be for the linear side of things. And uh, yeah, we're I think we ended up doing close to 300 shows this year uh, between video board and ACC network. So, Mike, you had a unique, yeah, a unique experience uh, with available space for your control room. Can you explain to everybody here that situation and what you did to solve the space problem? Yeah, I don't know that we solved the space problem, but um, so yeah, we, uh, we're very space limited in our athletic precinct at UVA, so, uh, um, and the space that we occupy when the arena, John Paul Jones Arena was opened was uh, one control room and four staff members. We now have three control rooms and nine staff members in the same physical space. Uh, so it required us to get pretty creative with um, how we were going to lay out the rooms, how we were going to make um, certain areas uh, multi-purpose or kind of modular for different scenarios. So if you want to advance the slide, it might help. So, um, so basically we have control room A, which is the physical space from our original control room um, when the arena opened. Um, and so for a digital setup, uh, or at least for kind of a basic digital setup uh, for an ad surf show. This serves as kind of the full control room. We can have graphics, uh, bug, tape in the back row, producer, director, uh, TD, AD in the front row. Um, but as you can see, it's pretty cozy. Uh, if you want to advance the slide, um, that was the linear basketball game we did earlier, earlier this year. So you can see the four people on the front row plus the three people in the back row. Go ahead and advance to the next one. Um, and then we have two smaller rooms that we use mainly for video board shows or for uh, pass-through um, ESPN shows. But for a linear scenario, we had to think creatively about how we could get the number of bodies required for doing linear TV for ESPN into this kind of setup that we have. So um, we were able to kind of rig it up so that we can move, you know, obviously all of this stuff is on KVMs, but we can move our replay room basically uh, or our replay controllers into our control room B to set that up as kind of a separate replay room for a linear scenario. Um, so, you know, it didn't make sense for us with the number of sports that we have, the number of events that we have to do to just, you know, say this room, you know, we're not gonna make it a control room. It's just gonna be kind of a tape room or whatever it may be for a linear scenario with the number of digital games that we do and the number of video board shows, we had to basically say, this can be a control room one day, tape room the next day, and get the most out of every kind of inch of space that we have in our rooms. Um, go ahead to the next one. And then we do have a third, um, this actually used to be an office. You can see it's kind of long and skinny. Still is an office for one person, so somebody sits at the end, that's their office, and then uh, when it's being used for uh, control room, um, they just put their headphones on. So, um, <laughs> so we could do, if we had to, you know, a, a, an ad serve level digital show out of this room if we really needed to. There is an audio console kind of uh, where the camera is put right now, but mainly this is our uh, kind of dedicated video board room for all the stuff that we do. So, um, and then we go ahead and advance it. Um, we did get a little extra space where a photocopier for media relations was sitting. We, we annexed that and put in our audio console. So we do have a, a separate dedicated audio room, which is crucial um, for doing linear TV and, and really for good sounding anything that you're doing. And then our engineering rack, um, is 10, 10 full racks, go ahead and advance. Um, so we, it's there somewhere. Uh, <laughs> yeah, there you go. So um, all the fiber patch infrastructure um, and uh, TOC, frame sinks, et cetera, kind of shoehorned into 10 racks in that room. So um, yeah, we, it's, it's not perfect, uh, it is cozy, but um, for our reality, it's kind of what we had to do. Um, but hopefully down the road, as more space becomes available, we're hoping to get some more space, especially you know uh, anybody who um, has had to cram people into control rooms and their fine workspaces. It's, it's not ideal to have people sitting around everywhere um, you know, trying to find places to work. So that's one of our main issues is just workspace for our staff. And we can make it clear to everybody, nobody is working out of the bathroom, correct? Not at this point, yeah. no. Um, so uh, if it did get us another person, we might you know, explore that option. Uh, besides money, what's been the biggest uh, your biggest obstacle to date? Eric, I'll start with you. Uh, for us, <clears throat> it was trying to keep our project on time. 
we were originally supposed to be in our uh, space the first week of January, and then uh, in the blink of an eye, we were 75 days behind. Um, turns out uh, our university building uh, officer who has to approve everything that was in an interim status when we were starting this build, and so things just kind of got backlogged. Um, we, had, we needed to add a unique fire suppression system in our space because we're on the bottom floor of our south end zone of our football stadium. So that took time to spec, took time to build, approve, and install. Uh, and then we found out that we needed some extensive conduit work at some of our venues. Some of them are pretty old and haven't been touched in a while. Uh, some of that needed to be new. Uh, we found out that some of our existing conduit was very crowded to the point you couldn't even pull another cable through there. So all of that added up to uh, more eyeballs, more approving the money, more approving the actual work getting done, and then pushing it through to actually be executed. So um, we tried really hard to, to stay on, on point, but as most projects go, nothing is done 100% on time. Ms. Kelly. I know we're gonna talk about construction later, uh, but that was definitely one of our biggest obstacles was the remote venues. Uh, we were retrofitting conduit and camera positions into every venue except for the Peterson Event Center. So we had a lot of work to do there, and then also just time and money goes into conduit, and we're actually still working on that. So while our control rooms are finished at this point, we are still finishing the venues. Got it. Jeremy, uh, explain for us the process of low bids and change orders during Let's your talk construction. Talk about construction. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we're all techies, right? We all understand the equipment we want. We understand integrators. We get that part. The part that was hardest for us was understanding, one, how to get to be able to spend your own money. We had to go to Frankfurt, which is our capital, and get a, 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 a bill passed in order to expedite this project because we were going to be building, we thought, this year before the launch. We moved it up a year, so that was an ordeal, even just to get started. Uh, but the low bid process is what got us. So for integrators, uh, depending on your state rules and regulations on how purchasing works. So a big understanding is understand your, your, your situation uh, at your institution. Uh, but the biggest problem is with the integrator, we were able to do best value. With construction in the state, you have to go with low bid. So as you all know, low bid is always not the best bid. So if after it's all said and done, low bid for construction for us after 27 change orders was way almost 25% higher than the, the third highest bid uh, from the original bid. So the construction part that you got to really, when you write those RFPs, hammer them in and keep those architects and construction uh, entities uh, accountable uh, for changes, uh-ohs, oh, we forgot. You know, here's a good example. Beck TV was our integrator, zero change orders. Construction, 27. It's a pretty hefty dollar amount. Absolutely. Uh, Eric, uh, explain to us about your construction delays and how you dealt with your campus, uh, your campus group to get it done. So uh, it's very important. Uh, to have somebody on your team that, that knows your RFP and your build to a T that can micromanage that and be married to it from start to finish. Uh, we have that at Virginia Tech, um, and so we were able to, to be on top of things that were missed or fell through the cracks or notice that, hey, you were supposed to cut a window in this replay room and you haven't done it. Uh, you can't go any further until that's done. Um, and so just making sure that you're having, that you're over communicating things and having daily meetings and daily phone calls, make sure everyone's on the same page because with projects this big, with the amount of money that's been invested, it's not a two or three, four person job. It's, it's a multi-department across different campus facets that, that have to get it done. And so um, there's a lot of things that can get muddy real quick. Uh, both for Michael and Jeremy, you mentioned to me that you use consultants when you began your process of building your control rooms. Can you tell me the positive and negatives uh, when going out of house to plan your control room? I'll start with you, Jeremy. Oh. <laughs> um, I only had one opportunity to do this. I wanted to do it right. You got, we, for us, we had eight million. I had eight million, not eight million and one dollars. I had eight million. So I needed someone to blame when something was forgot. No. <laughs> uh, the biggest part is, is I, I, if I had to do it again, I would use a consultant. Why? It's because he is my go-to guy. That's the guy that's gonna have, if he doesn't have the answers to my questions, he's got, he knows the contacts, those people to get a hold of. Now, when, but the thing is, is you also gotta understand that there's so much going on in this project that you got to have one person that can write the RFP to the language that's required for your situation, that, can, that knows what other projects are going on, that knows the ins and out of integration. 
you know, that was the biggest thing is, you know, when I say we have 4.6 in integration, I, I think we probably got closer to six mil in equipment, but we were able to get better purchasing because of going to a consultant and grouping things together. Getting 16, 15 schools to agree and all buying the same camera equipment is not gonna happen. So what you can do is get lucky and fortunate enough to, to know, they, they know they're, they're in the environment daily and they know what else is going out there outside of our own little campuses and our own little world. Yeah, I would, I would agree with that. And um, just the economies of scale you get by working with consultants as far as group purchasing power. And um, also just, uh, it helps to kind of have a baseline point to start at as far as equipment lists and things like that go. I mean, uh, as consultants have done more and more of these types of projects, there is kind of a, you know, you start, you're not starting from, from zero, you're starting from kind of a general set of equipment and standards that are you know required for this sort of work that being said no one knows your situation better than you a consultant is you know a consultant to me is a, is a great starting place for equipment lists and for the build out but um many times throughout the process you know we had to kind of put our foot down and say you know no we're not cutting this corner we're not getting rid of this camera we're not not cap you know we're not we're not putting 12 strands of fiber to this venue or whatever it may be just you know not specific examples, but you know, because we do have situations where we need this many cameras, or we have, you know, we, we are going to need to do sports at the or to cover sports at this venue. So I would say, make sure you you know what's right for your situation and for your venues and for your university, and don't deviate from that um, to, from things that you know you have to get. Kelly, you worked with the consultant at Pitt. Was it a good or bad experience, and what was the biggest lesson you learned from it? I would 100% agree with both of these guys. Um, if we were going to do it again, we would absolutely hire a consultant, especially because of the RFP process. Um, we didn't, at Pitt, we, no one had been through this type of project for the ACC network before. Our facilities management team at the university had never done something like this. Obviously, our department had never been through it. And so having a consultant who could help us to write that RFP and that initial equipment list was really important to us. Um, like Slammer saying, going through that equipment list and having somebody who can come to you initially and say, here are the things that you want to think about was really important. We spent a lot of time with our consultant going through that equipment list and really honing it. But then once it went out to bid and we got our best and finals um, back from manufacturers, that equipment list changed a lot. And so depending on what is acceptable at your university and what works for you budgetarily, I think we spent as much time with best and finals and going back with the manufacturers and reworking that equipment list as we did on the initial equipment list that we put out to bid. Um, so just understanding that once you go through it one time to get your bid ready, you're probably going to go through it a couple more times once you get bids back in so you can try to get the best bang for your buck based on those bids. Uh, a question for the, for the panel. We'll start with you, Mike. Uh, what was the most important lesson you've learned and you want to share with our audience today concerning the whole process of building out your facilities and preparing for the ACC network launch? Um, wow. Uh, so I think from our end, um, and if there's one thing I can impart to just hammer home with administrations that the equipment and the facilities are one thing, but they're only as good as the people you have to actually do the productions, keep the stuff running day in and day out. So um, it was, it's, it has to be said over and over and over again to administrations that, you know, when this sort of thing is happening, you have to staff it appropriately. And um, otherwise you're gonna burn people out. The production quality is not gonna be as good as you want it to be. So just that the personal, ca the, uh, the, the human capital has to go hand in hand with all of the equipment and facilities that are being built. Otherwise it's, you know, you can throw as much money up at the facilities you want, but you're not gonna get the results that you're looking for. Jeremy? Ditto. Uh, we have two positions open right now. You can log on to louisville.edu <laughs> slash jobs. <laughs> Got it in. Uh, that and the biggest thing now is you've always had the problem before is we can't do that because equipment limitation. Now that's not a, an answer. Can you do that? Yes. Now is should we do that? You know, you don't have to do everything and, and pick and choose. You know, that's the thing is we, we are all excited. We all want to do well above those minimum requirements set by ESPN and then now we're like, wait a minute. <laughs> do we really need to do everything as a digital or as a, you know, pr we were producing our digital shows like they were linear. 
for what we thought were linear. But that was the biggest thing is now, now that you have that and equipment's not your limitation is be very selective on that schedule because burnout does get you. 413 events in 10 months, not one year, 10 months, that's a lot. Kelly. For us it was communication, kind of like what Eric was saying earlier. Uh, during this ACC network build out, we had a daily phone call with every single member of our full-time staff and our systems integrator and almost daily construction meetings. And the people who are your ACC network producers or your expression ops, um, if they're full-time for you, you may not m think initially that you need to have them in on that level of like minutia with your build out. But for us, it really worked because everyone was on the same page every step of the way. Uh, and it's actually something that we've carried into designing our workflow now that we're in the spaces. You can't get bogged down by having necessarily a daily meeting for an hour with everybody. Uh, not everyone has time for that in their day. But making sure that people don't end up in silos has been really important to us. And trying to keep everyone on the same page is something that we learned during the network build so that we can pick up for each other. Especially when a new project lands on your head at the ninth hour um, or the eleventh hour. Uh, it's best if you can have people who can pick up for you because they already know what's going on in your department. For us, uh, it's really important uh, to be to find someone to sell the investment uh, to to those in your administration. We're incredibly fortunate at Virginia Tech to have a senior level administrator uh, who grew up on TV trucks and in the TV business, and she has been uh, our biggest advocate. Um, and she helps explain uh, to the people in higher positions that make the big decisions why you need to spend a hundred thousand dollars on a camera or why our switcher costs so much. Um, those kind of things that. Uh, that, that maybe we aren't the best at, at communicating that, but um, somebody like that that can uh, <clears throat> uh, get those decisions uh, made is really, really, really helpful. Question for both uh, Kelly and Eric. When people talk about control room build outs, they think about building out your control rooms, but nobody really thinks about building out your venues um, with you know fiber, camera platforms, those types of things. What's the thought process that went into your decisions when preparing for your venues, Kelly, first? Uh, so for us, as I was saying earlier, we really didn't have camera positions uh, at baseball, softball, soccer, uh, volleyball, gymnastics, wrestling. So we had a lot of work to do and also in those venues we didn't have conduit. Uh, so leaning on our systems integrator and our consultant to make sure that we put in enough conduit, which was super expensive, and then also trying to figure out how to build camera towers in a lot of these venues, which was also super expensive, was something that we didn't necessarily see coming when we spent a lot of time early in the project thinking about what we wanted to put in the rooms themselves. Um, so it was something that was always in the back of our heads, but when we really sat down and started looking at the construction costs and the work that we had to do to be ready for um, the ACC network, we had a lot of work to catch up on. Um, and at the end of the day, you can have whatever type of switcher, whatever type of graphics, but if your camera positions aren't there, really what are you putting out? Uh, so we had a lot of work to do, and <clears throat> as I said earlier, we're still finishing. Um, we're still sending emails about what type of crane or winch we're gonna put in so we can winch equipment in place. And so the positions are there, but then there's that next step of, okay, so how do I actually make these usable? What do I have to do for fall protection, if anything? And so there's a lot of things that we're, we're still figuring out. Fortunately, you know, for us, a lot of our venues are older. They w weren't necessarily designed or implemented uh, with television in mind. And so we've kind of had to go back and rework some of the things. And so um, uh, we went with permanent towers where we needed them at, at baseball, softball, uh, lacrosse, um, and soccer. Um, with safety in mind, number one, for our students and our equipment, um, making sure that they're tall enough, getting as close to ESPN specs as we possibly can, making sure that they're, they're large enough to fit more than just one camera out there so we can continue to, to push the envelope and, and do beyond the bare minimum. Um, and then it's, it's, it's adding things down the road, pulling more fiber uh, to each venue uh, than we need to, um, to provide additional growth down the line um, is, is really important for us. You kind of led me into my next question and I'll, I'll start with Slammer on this one. He talked about building for the future. What have you guys done, or what are you doing right now to build for your future? Huh. Um, so one of the big things um, that we found is, uh, so with 
the ACC network, obviously there's additional revenue that's coming in. Hope, you know, fingers crossed, everybody call your cable companies. Um, but uh, there's not a sort of like one to, it's not a one to one thing where, you know, additional marginal revenue comes in through the TV deal and then that filters down to, um, you know, the video operation to maintain equipment, to, you know, stay current, to uh, continue upgrading. So I think one of the big things is figuring out creative ways for, uh, in operational budgets to build in room for equipment renewal and replacement um, because, you know, we're going to be going into our fourth year in our rooms essentially, or I guess, yeah, fourth year with our cameras, um, you know, the year that the network launches and as anybody who's used video equipment can tell you like, you know, especially doing 400 shows a year, it puts a lot of wear and tear on the equipment and um, so, uh, I would say that's one of the biggest challenges for us in, as far as getting ready for what's next because we're going to be doing more shows every single year from now into, until forever um, and just trying to figure out ways that we can budget to maintain and upgrade our stuff um, over the course of time. Jeremy? Media future, we need an archive system. You got 400 shows, it's a lot of hours of content that we, <clears throat> and to better utilize it across all departments in our, excuse me, <coughs> in our athletic departments, how can everybody now share that that content so we you know we have creative guys that would go out and shoot each specific sport let's say football wants our footage well they're not going to have super slow-mo hdr 4k footage maybe they do maybe they don't but now we have that so now it's how do we file how do we how do we store all those files and how are we going to share them amongst ourselves so that's our first and next immediate step and then the biggest thing is is maintaining what we have and then you know what we thought you know I thought, you know, 10 cameras, that's more than enough. I need five more, you yeah. know. So that's the other thing is, you know, expanding what we have uh, and keeping it, keeping it running. You know, yeah. baseball goes to a lens, you know, but, it, you know, that those aren't cheap. No, not uh, at all. Kelly? Uh, same for us on a couple of those things. We're looking at media asset management systems now. Uh, we definitely have a storage problem. So that's next on our list of figuring out where we can store all the footage that we get from the ACC network and from our post-production team. Uh, we're also working with our business office just to keep the line of communication open about what it takes to maintain the equipment that we put in. Uh, you don't want to spend a ton of money and then just let it sit there and start degrading right away. So making sure that every year we're putting in an investment um, and making sure that we're protecting that equipment is really important to us. And then like Eric said earlier, uh, we made sure that when we were doing our initial um, cable infrastructure and putting in fiber, that we ran extra fiber to every one of our venues uh, so that, that way hopefully we'd be ready in the future for whatever comes next. Eric? For us, uh, we got $10 million improved to invest in our facility. So when you see that number, uh, there's a lot of options there, but it also goes quickly. So <clears throat> we were strategic in, in fitting some other things into that uh, number uh, to help us across the board at apartment. So number one, we took care of our network control rooms. That was phase one. Phase two is uh, we're, we are now refurbishing our two existing control rooms and finishing out our venue work. Phase three in the fall, we'll be building a new studio space with the fifth control room. So four of those five control rooms are going to be, uh, we've got two linear rooms. Those four can also be used for video board rooms. Um, if we ever got to the point where we had to do four broadcasts, not that I would advocate for that, we could do that. Um, and so, and so uh, we were able to work in our archive system to that. Uh, we, we bought enough cameras, enough intercom systems to separate big screen and network productions, uh, which helps both of those, of those areas as well. So, um, and then the, the last thing um, is we, we are pushing really hard to be able to make sure that some of that revenue that we make goes directly back into our budget for equipment costs, repairs, uh, staffing, anything that we can kind of put that towards. Yeah. One, one quick thing. Yeah. Stay in contact with your facilities, guys. If there's ever a facility upgrade, know about it. Because that's where you're going to save a lot of your cost on putting in conduit, running extra fiber. Put conduit in, don't put fiber in it. So know what projects are going on on your campuses and, and see, think when they, like if you have an old facility that didn't think about TV, have them think about TV. You know, a lot of these companies now you are using other consultants to bid facilities. Some are, are thinking about TV. Some don't even, not even blip on our radar. You know, we did we did our football expansion, and we knew uh, when we closed the bowl, we needed camera locations. So carving those out, we saved a lot of money on the front end without a change order on carving those wells out on the front end. Absolutely. I, I'll piggyback on that real yeah. quick as well and say that you can also kind of get creative with facility projects in sneaking some broadcast equipment into those projects. So, like, we've got a new softball stadium opening, and 
it's got a video board, so hooray. And uh, we're, like yep, so, and, and so you can kind of make the case with those additional capital projects, well, well, okay, we need additional channels of graphics, so we're sneaking another expression box, et cetera, et cetera. So I think that's a good, definitely a good, a good tip. A dirty four letter word in television for all of us is crew. How are you handling crew? What are your plans for crew? What do you do for crew right now? Kelly, I'll start with you. We use a mixture of full-time staff, students, and local freelancers. Being in Pittsburgh, uh, we're surrounded by professional teams, which means that the crew in the area that we can bring in for freelance is really um, top-notch, so we're lucky there. And as far as students go, uh, we haven't traditionally had a broadcast program. Uh, we've had a communications major, a film major, and we've pulled some students out of those groups, but we actually uh, partnered with the academic side of the house uh, between athletics and academics and funded a position this past uh, year to launch the first broadcast class at Pitt. And so that started this past January and we're hoping that as that grows, we'll be able to grow our student base as well. Uh, we recognize that we definitely need a larger student base if we're gonna keep up with the number of productions. Slammer. Yeah, it's similar for us. We have a mixture of full-time staff, uh, semi-professional freelancers and students and we also are uh, uh, working with our uh, media studies program at UVA, so we're going into the fifth semester of a class that we basically adjunct teach uh, along with a uh, professor in media studies, and they have to work events, they have to do post-production for us, um, and over time, again, like Kelly said, we're hoping that'll sort of snowball and build out larger student crews that we can use uh, during all four of their years at UVA. Jeremy? Um, we have doctors, lawyers, and engineers. We don't have broadcast uh, journalism. Uh, one good exciting thing is because of that, uh, we built uh, the Department of Communications is more geared towards streaming and social media, but they are starting a sports broadcasting class uh, that hadn't been announced, but it's already online. We've uh, had 24 at positions available, 12 have already signed up, and that's just by word of mouth. But uh, the biggest thing is, is we use freelancers, and it was hard for us as being a little over century located to a lot of larger markets. So it was hard saying, hey, ESPN comes in or Fox comes in, and you want me to come work for you for half, your, half my day rate? But the problem is they realized they weren't there for 10 or 12 hours. They were there for five hours. You know, we, we are pre-building, not saying they're white gloving, but it was kind of funny that one of my lead uh, freelancers was, was like, I'm not gonna come work for you. I'm not gonna, you know, I'm gonna stay true to what, it, what old school TV used to be. And this past year he made more uh, annually than he has ever done. Yeah. So it's kind of funny, it's, it's ma makes up in quantity. <laughs> Absolutely. How about Eric, what do you guys do at Virginia Tech? Um, Blacksburg isn't exactly a metropolis, so we are all <laughs> full-time staff and students. We don't reach out to freelancers unless we absolutely have to. Um, so we've got eight full-time students that we hire as freshmen and we pay their tuition, and they're with us until they're seniors, so we get them for three to four years. We've got four graduate assistants that are an extension of our full-time staff, and we've got about an additional 50 approximately production assistants that we pay hourly, and all of those students are very heavily invested in everything that we're doing across our department. Uh, and they're very committed to, to what we're doing. Remember everybody, these are all on, this is all historically archived. You can take this back and, and show your administrators what Virginia Tech's doing, giving out tuition. Uh, that's, that's unbelievable. Um, Kelly, uh, how has the partnership with NEP helped with your engineering uh, needs and their needs? So NEP is actually in our backyard. They're about 20 minutes from the university and for those of you who don't know, they have an apprentice engineering program out of their corporate headquarters in Pittsburgh. And so their apprentice engineers do a lot of field shop work with them, um, but what they didn't have as part of that program was the opportunity for those apprentices to have hands-on event and broadcast experience. And so partnering with NEP, they're sending their apprentice engineers to every single one of our broadcasts, scoreboard shows, um, even really small events uh, that we do that might be one or two cameras and they're supporting our full-time engineer. Um, and so that's amazing for us because we get an extra set of hands and it's great for them because it gives them an opportunity for those apprentices to get out and see a, an event as it's happening. I, I'm gonna jump ahead a question here for our, everybody. Uh, understanding ESPN standards and expectations for the ACC network, what are you doing from a training standpoint to ready your crews for broadcast? Slammer, you can go first. Uh, yeah, so um, we kind of, sort of view it almost as a hierarchical progression for our crews and students. So students, you know, they start, any, any, any freelancer or student who ends up wanting to work uh, on our shows kind of 
start by shadowing for a few games. They then might, you know, run uh, equipment on a board show or a non-reimbursed stream. You know, once the producers and directors think that they're up to speed, we might put them on a reimbursed show and then, you know, kind of progressing from that up to um, the linear level. So it's really kind of just a, a ladder that, you know, once, you know, some people climb it quickly, other people don't climb it, other people don't climb it at all. Um, but uh, another thing we're trying to do this year is after kind of instituting some post-show paperwork that the producer and director will fill out for every single game, giving feedback on every single crew member. So we do kind of have a uh, database of, you know, so when somebody asks us, why don't I get more work or why, are, why am I not being put on these higher level shows, we kind of have, you know, well, these are the things that happen. Here's where you need to improve. Mr. Chairman. Understanding ESPN standards and expectations. Now, understanding that those understandings change. <laughs> That's the biggie. Uh, the biggest thing is is a professional development for your staff. You know, everybody wants Ross training, but I don't want the training on how to turn the box on. I want more in-depth on the programming and changing and that kind of thing. So that's something that we're really looking into this next couple of years is higher next step uh, other than, hey, this is the box, this is how you turn it on, this is how you launch the software. Uh, so professional help for our own staff. And then we're actually going into now, and we're starting to, it's funny because we're talking about schools, we're, we're grading our freelancers. You know, what is our A crew? What is our B crew? What's a C crew? Mm -hmm. And that's from all staff. That's from the professional uh, freelancers all the way to a student. And that's, you know, we, we try to, we were trying to do post-production meetings after every show, but when the quantity is, it just wasn't time. So we were to try to be more selective on what shows we do evaluate. We're not gonna evaluate a three camera women's lacrosse game, right. but you know, a higher level show, then yeah, get it more into the weeds on why we did something versus why we didn't do something. With 15 Kelly. So understanding the number of events and how much of a <clears throat> tax it can be on your full-time staff, we're this summer making sure that we identify some of our freelancers that we know are ready to take the next step as producers or directors and putting some workshops together that they can come in and do with us over the summer. So that, that way we know we have a few more people that we can rely on. And then for Pitt, uh, when a linear production is out of our facility, there are certain positions in the room that actually have to be staffed with union members. And so when that happens, it means that our full-time staff isn't necessarily working that linear show, but can take a step back and watch what's happening in the room and what ESPN's crew is doing. And that's a professional development opportunity for us. Eric? For us, we ask as many of our students to come back to school uh, a few days early as we can. And we have a pretty intensive uh, multi-day training session uh, where we do mock shows and they get training on all the equipment. Um, we utilize our full-time staff who are uh, kind of specialized in sp specific areas, producing, directing, TDing, to kind of help bring up kids and train them up. Uh, we, we, we identify lead operators from our student pool in each, op in each area. They help develop uh, uh, the, the up-and-coming students to create some depth at each position. Uh, we're starting to have more uh, organized review and evaluation se sessions beyond just recapping after each show. Um, and then we crew and, and, and everything, all of our digital shows, just like a linear show would be. So uh, there really is no difference. We, we crew a separate director, producer, TD, uh, AP, uh, and s with the idea in mind that, that there's no difference for us between a digital and linear show. So when the linear shows do happen, um, everybody is very comfortable in their roles and they know what's coming, they know what's expected of them. Uh, last question for the panel here. We've touched on a lot of different subjects today. I want to go around the horn one more time with all of you, and I want you to give me that one more important point you think that the, our audience needs to know today. So, Slammer, I'll start with you first. Um, sure. Uh, so, I think one thing that we heard a lot from our colleagues in the SEC, uh, and maybe Eric can touch more on this, but you know, they got two years into the SEC network and. They were whizzing along and doing linear shows and all these ad serve ESPN events and then they kind of stepped back and said, wait a second, like what's happened to our scoreboards? What's happened to our post-production? And I think we took that away and thought, you know, there, we, uh, I think most of our schools in the ACC have thought we really don't want to have that happen where we're slipping in other areas and not providing great game entertainment to the fans and not providing great post-production content um, for you know, behind the scenes stuff for all our teams and highlights and things like that. So I think the biggest thing as we launch the network and we've, we've had the unique opportunity to kind of ramp up to it over the course of several years as opposed to the SEC who just went full bore, um, but trying to, to figure out strategies to 
efficiently do the best job with all the three different areas of our business. Um, and we're still trying to figure out the best ways to be efficient and uh, save time where we can while still delivering the best content across all three different areas. So um, I think that's one of the biggest things we're thinking about heading into 2019. Jeremy. The same thing. We didn't want our board shows to suffer. Uh, we have a very elaborate football show. We have a very elaborate basketball show at, at Louisville. So we didn't want that to slip down. You know, we wanted it to improve with all the great technology that we have. But th the biggest thing right now is, is burnout. Uh, it's, we, we can't preach enough uh, on the hours that it takes. You know, you, got, you come in and you think that what it's going to take to pull this off. But those are very 10, 10, 10 and 10 months of seven days a week, 10 to 12 hour days. With that being said, if you want to come to Louisville, we've got two job openings, louisville.edu. What's that website again? <laughs> Where, yeah. One more. That's my last time to talk. So. <laughs> I think not only being uh, honest with your administration about burnout, but then also with the fact that once your rooms are open, they're not done. Uh, as I said earlier, we're still finishing in our venues, but we also have things that we're still figuring out in our control rooms that maybe don't work exactly the way we thought they would, or our workflow has changed, and we're constantly revamping, or our engineers chasing something down that was working last week but now isn't. And so just being honest with your administration, I think, is really important about the fact that Yes, you open this beautiful brand new facility, but we can't hit the ground running at a thousand percent, maybe only like, you know, 150 or something. Uh, for me, there's three things. Uh, one is uh, have, have those philosophical discussions with your administration in the off season and establish what you want this model to be. Are we doing X number of shows just to check a box to say that uh, we did them or are we doing really good high quality productions because that's what we, that was what we care about the most. Number two, um, uh, is to sell that it is an investment. And yes, we put a whole lot of money in it up, up at the front, but in a couple of years, there's going to be more money needed. You're going to want to buy more cameras. Things are going to break. Things are going to wear down. And then just to back up what everyone else has already said about staffing, uh, you've got to invest in equipment as much as you invest in people uh, or the other way around. Um, so, and then, you know, at, for, for, at Virginia Tech, uh, we'll have five network people by the end of July. We have three big screen um, in our big screen department, three people in our creative side, and then four people in our operations department. We're going to hire a junior engineer. So um, if you can hire multiple engineers that are going to have to help support all this and keep it all running, uh, that keeps them very happy, which keeps everyone else happy. Well, I just want to take the time to first of all tell you thank you for uh, coming on and, and speaking to the subjects today. Uh, this is a very, very smart, talented group of people. I would suggest if you're looking to build a control room or you have a control room and you have issues, please seek them out. They are a wealth of knowledge. And uh, again, thank you all very, very much. Uh, and thank you everybody for uh, attending this uh, part of the session today. So thank you. All.